Welcome to the Agile Advocate Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Drew, and I'm here with Vince Pecorero. Yeah, nice to be here. Vince, you're with AFWorks. Give us a rundown of AFWorks. Sounds yeah. incredibly interesting. So AFWorks is an innovation project and uh, really a, a culture change project for the Air Force. We were stood up to connect innovators and accelerate results. We were stood up by the Secretary of the Air Force about two years ago now, maybe two and a half years ago. And we've been venturing into all sorts of areas, but my, my specialty is in agile contracting. So I'm the agile contracting capability lead. I help teams find agile contracting pathways, both external like companies into the government and our government program offices. I help them find ways to buy stuff better and more efficiently. I also focus, I'm doing a lot of work recently with Base of the Future initiatives with Tyndall Air Force Base. Base of the Future? Yes, it's a very grand vision, and I think by definition, never really achievable because the future is always <laughs> coming, right? Okay. So it's an iterative thing, but we're working really hard. Uh, there's a lot of really smart people on the team. We're branching out and looking at everything from microgrids to really high-end technology services to better building, more resilient buildings. It's a unique project because... It's been a long time since the Air Force has been able to build a base from scratch. As you know, Tyndall was destroyed by Hurricane Hurricane Michael October of last year. And Congress finally appropriated some funding to get after that project. So it's really like we have a clean slate to so rebuild. So you're rebuilding on the site? Rebuilding on the site, right? Mm -hmm. Mother, so you get Mother to Nature be damned. To... Doing it. <laughs> yeah, the probability of that happening? Yeah. Come on. I mean, it's not it's gonna only going to get again. <laughs> So you get to run down to Panama City. That's nice. Yeah. So uh, I get to spend some time down there, look at the site. And I can tell you the whole region is still pretty devastated from yeah. from, from the hurricane yeah, down there. a year after the I fact. was just down there a little while ago. Which is really sad because we live in America. It's a first world country. It's something you would expect to see in other places of the world maybe, but but not here. So it's a real opportunity. And then given the amount of funding that Congress has appropriated, you know, a few billion dollars to, to get after this project, we have the ability to make something truly special down there. So are you going to apply agile contracting on that? Oh, we're looking at so many different ideas. We're going to scare some people. So who get, who, I mean, it takes heroes here to step forward and get outside of the boundaries. So we were just talking with Adam Furtado with Kessel Run, and he was talking all about its culture getting people to change the way they did before. I mean, they were successful, right? So you're talking about the high brass, and now you're asking them to do, if you could, after being so successful and moving up in this organization, this gigantic organization, could we change the way that you work right now? Culture's the number one thing. With HalfWorks, we all have call signs. So my call sign's Swath. Love it. None of us go by rank. Rank doesn't matter in our culture. You never go and talk to anybody as in Colonel so-and-so? No, no. There's no rank. No one wears a uniform when we're off-site. The only time is when we're in the Pentagon or at something like AFA when we're kind of expected to, to dress in uniform or more professionally. You see I'm in a t-shirt today. Uh, it doesn't look Air Force. Well, I came off an airplane today, so this is <laughs> not a branded branded shirt. But but yeah, we, we, we definitely have a unique culture. We do most of our activities off-base. We have hubs in Vegas, D.C., and Austin, Texas, really designed to be open to the community community to bring good ideas in and then to, to be a place where Airmen can collaborate with industry and academia so that we can get the good ideas into our culture and see how the rest of the world's doing things. How much progress are you making overall on agile funding, contracting, and acquisition? So I, I will tell you, Congress has given us a lot of tools. So 10 USC 2371B is another transaction agreement authority that Congress really codified with the FY16 NDAA. And with that authority, they allowed us to kind of move outside of the federal acquisition regulation, uh, the FAR, and do contracting much differently. With that authority, we're, we're really branching out. Most organizations that have tried this have only been able to use 3,600 funds, which is our uh, R&D prototyping type of funds. So um, you're outside of the R&D world. You've started to work with like regular colored. So imagine using a uh, prototyping authority to prototype with Milcon funding. Milcon funding is for specific buildings. You know, Congress... Specific building, they're like, this funding goes to that kind of building? It goes to that kind of building. It's, it's got a much longer time horizon than, than other types of funding. And it's never been done before. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about when I'm saying we're going to scare people. We have a, a great leadership in Dr. Roper, it's FAQ, 
And he's really empowered us to go try and do stuff. General Holt as well within the contract community of the Air Force said, hey, go after it, try it, be a mission focused business leader and be bold. So we're, we're pushing forward some of these initiatives that no one's tried. And, and really the rules are a little bit ambiguous on whether or not it's, it's legal to do some of the stuff, just the way Congress has written it. And then the finance office has interpreted it. So we're going to try and until someone tells us we broke the rules too badly, we're going to keep pressing forward and, and really get after some innovation. So do you think you could be, I guess it's obviously your goal to translate. What's the, I guess the hurdle to get out there? to the rest of DOD and the rest of Air Force? So you have a very ingrained culture of people that have been doing this. In the acquisition world, many people did a whole military career they retired and they came back as civilian leaders. they did leaders. a great job. They did a great I mean, job, successful. right? successful. Everybody gave them, you know, promotions. They Our military is still the best in the world. Yeah. So we have a lot of people that say, hey, what we've been doing is working. What's but, wrong? But what they don't realize is that China has advanced and closed the gap so dramatically. I mean, they're coming after us on every form. AI, they're probably beating us, to be honest. They attack our systems every day. And it's... It's, it's a gap that's been closed, so the near-peer adversary is, is maybe a misnomer. They are a peer adversary, and they're coming for us. And they don't have to play by the same rules that we do. I think our system is better. I think it will prevail in the end. But that's the struggle that we're fighting against. If we don't change our ways, we'll get eaten alive. So... AFWorks is made up of a, a several things, isn't it? Is it? Are we talking about Spark Tank? How 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 is yeah, that related? Yeah, exactly. So we have a, a bunch of different capabilities we bring together, and we call AFWorks a fusion of capabilities. Mm. Spark Tank being one of those where we have Airmen go and pitch their ideas, very much like Shark Tank. And I did the, some of these ideas are like, duh. Why didn't we just think of this? The munitions out of the ninety is it the ninetieth? Yeah. So. You'll see a lot of ideas that would be like common sense to most yeah. people that pitch, hey, this seems like an efficient good idea. It's made $5 million a year for you. But in reality, the government system is not structured to take ideas from airmen. It's like the opposite of design thinking yeah. from your, your end user. It's not designed to do that. So this was a way to kind of get after that. Another thing that our Spark Tank uh, really helps with is it could help with retention. So... The millennials, the people that are serving in the Air Force right now at more at, at a junior grade, they want to be heard. They want their opportunity. They want their ideas to be out in the world in a hierarchical structure like the Air Force. That's not always easily done. Well, this gives them an avenue for their voice to be heard, for their idea to get at least some eyes on from a colonel or a senior leader. And with Spark Tank at AFA, we have, you know, the, the secretary of the Air Force and the chief of staff sitting there yeah, listening to these guys. guys ideas. Are, they were showing up with checkbook. Yeah, they they did, and we had Mark Cuban last year, and uh, yeah, George Steinberg on the fourth. It was it was great. Was really yeah, it was a lot of fun. So that's that's one of our capabilities. We also have Spark Cells. I want to say there's around over fifty of them now across the country. These Spark Cells. Spark Cells. So these are at the base level. The airmen decide to form a Spark Cell to fill a need at their base. What do you mean the airmen decide? The airmen decide. So you're, you're the the guy in the ground. Crazy talk. Crazy talk. Yeah, the airmen decide that they have a, a gap on their base, be it professional development or just an entry point for ideas to come in. They decide they want to form a spark cell. And so what do you, how do they even know to this? You guys reach out to them and we say, do. hey, you know. Oh, do you? Okay. Tremendous amount of outreach. Okay. Tony Perez, call sign Queso, is the lead for our spark cells. And he is on the road probably as much as me, if not more. Definitely going out, shaking hands, meeting the airmen, because he's got a strong passion to seeing the airmen ideas be realized. That's where all the good ideas really so live. So the hard thing here is communicating t- out to everybody that says, you know, you can do this. So that's his, he just, he just, he's going on whirlwind tours. Whirlwind tours. And once he gets, gets one little entrepreneur that says, yes, this is a good idea. I should try this. I have a passion for this. He'll work with that that commander, that lieutenant colonel, 06, whoever, to really empower that person to say, all right, here's your space. They might give him a, a room on base. They might give him a whole building on base, or they might just give him some space off base to go and meet. And now that that leader, that airman, whatever he may be, that leader now gets interfaced with the leadership on their base at a relatively routine basis. Okay. So how does that kind of go over? It must be mixed bag, right? Ah, sure. I mean, we, we've had some, uh, Would you please salute when you come in here next time, airman? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, well, here's the thing. They come with good ideas, yeah. right? They say, look, here's what can make our life suck less, right? Here's, here's something that really w- we could use a better way to turn the wrench. But you know, even if you've got a great idea, sometimes it's like, I don't care. So is the culture getting in your way or are they looking at it going, wow, 
So that could really help me. We have a really good chief of the Air Force, and he appro- he's carved out money called Squadron Innovation Funds, we call them SIF funds, uh, to really reinvigorate at the squadron level. Oh, so he's already given money to this. He's That's given nice. money to this kind of. He oh. gave money at the squadron level. So that money flows down through the wing structure, and a lot of our spark cells have tapped into those funds to be able to deliver on innovations within their units and on their base. So that that's, that's been an avenue, right? If you, if you have a good idea, that's, that's perfect, but idea only takes you so far. Right. You got to be able to fund it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. And funding, it's another piece. And the third piece is acquiring it. So if you have that Holy Trinity in place, now you can go and actually realize this cool idea or this vision. And you come in at the acquisition. I come in at the acquisition side. We have our airmen providing all the great ideas. We have a, a host of tools that we, we get after to help them do that. We, we use an internal ideation platform called Idea Scale, mm. where we allow teams to put ideas out there or run campaigns. Those ideas can get crowdsourced, upvoted, downvoted. And then the best ideas can be viewed by the senior leaders at whatever level. If it's at the base level, by the base leadership, and they can decide, hey, this, this, this will help us with retention or this will help us with, you know, whatever problem we're having on base. So you have some kind of visibility across not just that, but they bubble up to a higher level. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It has to. It has okay. to, right? Because we're still a hier- hierarchical structure. Sure. Leadership still has to make, make some calls. Yeah, but, but he does, they don't stay isolated on that base. No. They start bubbling up to, like, the Air Force. Oh, the Air Force chief of staff. They 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 all have been briefed. Uh, the vice chief gets a brief from uh, AFWorks, I think once a month, maybe quarterly, uh-huh. on on our different initiatives within the A eight Air Force structure. General Nahum he does a Freestyle Friday, I think once a quarter as well, with different spark cells to hear their ideas. So I mean, that's a three star general. I mean, we're talking about real leaders within the Air Force being able to hear what our airmen need and what they want and what will make their lives better. That's incredible. So that, see, one of the things that we're pushing is we're pushing and, and involved in, like organization, the Veterans Administration. And what we're doing is transformation of DevOps and the whole delivery, development delivery structure. You can't scale by one group, right? You have to scale by spreading the good word, right? So you guys have put together evangelist cells that are going out there and you say, if you come up with a good idea, there's some money there. So it's really interesting. You mentioned you interviewed Kessel Run earlier. So AFWorks noticed that there's all these great DevOps groups forming and doing stuff all across the services, not just the Air Force. So gosh, maybe about four or five months ago, we had a workshop out of our Vegas hub where we brought all the different government DevOps groups under one house. There's like over 30 of them. There's 30. Yeah. over the, there's, a, there's a lot of different groups. In Air Force? Uh, no, no uh, we had some Army, Navy. Okay. Yeah, we had some That's other great. guys, the Marines. We brought them all in and we started to storyboard how we could put together a virtual DevOps group. They're calling it Duradama. And again, I'm not as close to it as uh, I should be to have the, like, the most recent details on it, but they're going to run out of PEO Bez. That's down in Alabama. Uh, Business Enterprise Systems is the, is the PEO shop there. Yeah. And we got a, a tech stack that we looked at and gotten approved with uh, the CIO's office. And it should be a nice soft landing place for airmen to come when they show any interest at all in wanting to code. So instead of them working on just all their off hours on some crazy Excel spreadsheet, (laughs) right? They show little interest and they can self-select and and be pushed to to this program where they can go get the equivalent of PME to go learn how to code. So there's the same kind of coding shops that Silicon Valley uses to, you know, 10-week intensive coding, how to do the basics class. Uh, We're sending our airmen to that kind of stuff now. So they get... One, the exposure on how to do it properly. And then two, we have this tech stack where there's a community that they can now be a part of. So the moment they move bases, their project that they work so passionately on doesn't just Comes die in the vine, yeah. right? They can work on it from anywhere in the world. Wow. And I mean, that's the vision. Again, it's it's a vision. It's I definitely like a it. culture change, right, for the Air Force. It's Oh, yeah. yeah we, that's true. We have actually a career field for you know people in that space, but it had been really grossly underutilized. And now they're starting to reinvigorate it and realize that, hey, this is just like being able to speak Arabic, being able to code. That's exactly what Adam said. Right. It's, it's, I have a language. Yeah, it's a language it's skill. It's called Java. Yeah. Yeah. So the interesting thing there, too, is it must be like a dream place for somebody like Nicholas Shalon on the, on the Air Force. And the Air Force being leading that and the DOD chief of staff. He was on our podcast and he was talking about software factories building a competency, a core competency in that. 
and then have the products that you guys build, all that competency goes away with a, with a contractor. The end of that, the acquisition of that contractor goes, have to spin it up again. Now you've got airmen. We'll have airmen that, that can be the uh, continuity. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's really where we need to get to. That's what all the big companies have, right? They might bring in expertise and they need to have a certain piece or maybe do some product testing, right? To really like worst case scenario it. But no, to have some continuity, some base level capability from an airman's perspective within the Air Force is critical. Oh, I, I did products in the private space forever. It's all about the core people. That there's, there's like certain core people, you know, it's like on anything, right? And if you lose that capability and you're dead, really, you have to spin it all up again. It's so expensive too, right? And so we want to make sure that that competency stakes her out. But that is another thing about acquiring talent. Yeah. So from the Air Force's perspective, we're trying to partner more with industry so that they can see the talent that we have inside, but also our, our airmen can see the tools that industry is using on the outside. So we have a pilot program we're going to be launching here. I want to say the first cohort is in January. It's with a company called Shift. And they're going to be doing like, or they have an algorithm that kind of matches skill sets with companies. So we're applying that to like, hey, here's the airmen's you know, background, what they're good at, what companies could you match them with? And it's, I want to say we're doing six weeks. I could be off on that. It might be, might be six four. weeks of six weeks of, Hey, you're not going to work for the Air Force for these six weeks. You're going to go work for this company. It's not nearly as intensive as education with industry would be like an EWE program, which is a year long, but it should be enough of a taste that the airmen can really see the tools that are out there. The companies can see the skill set that the Air Force does bring to it, an Air Force member, be it the leadership competencies or just the confidence to go and execute. You marry those two together and, and that should create a partnership going forward. So as industry does something great, they feed it back into the government system. As the government decides to do something great and, and produce these really valuable people as they retire out, they move into industry seamlessly. And that's what we want to see, like a free flow back and forth where we have the good ideas transferring and the technology that's being pushed by industry being adopted by the government at a much faster pace. So are you seeing that in places like Kessel Run? Oh, Kessel Run is a great group. Those guys actually work pretty closely with Actworks on a lot of projects. But uh, yes, we are. The problem with Kessel Run is it's not scalable in the same way that you'd want to see it across the whole Air Force. Their model, is, and it's not a problem, it's, it's, it's their, their prototype, their proof of concept. So their model is you go and work with them for, you know, as a TDY for a period of months, and then you go back to your home station. Oh, so you're looking at something more permanent. Yeah, well, we're looking at something that's more free flow. And... You know, if we take what Kessel Run does and move it to a virtual platform, you can go anywhere. You don't have to. So That's true. when you send an airman TDY out of their unit for you know, six months or a year, or however long you, you send them away, well, they're not part of the unit anymore. <laughs> they physically left. So you're, you're kind of creating a, a really cool bubble of talent. But when they come back, they don't have any of that support structure anymore. It's all stuck in that bubble. Kessel Run guys are, are really being the spearhead for the culture change in the Air Force of we should be doing DevOps, we should be coding our own stuff, we should not be shelling out millions and millions of dollars for companies to code very simple things that they can take on. I mean, heck, they're taking on F-35, I think some stuff with Alice. I don't know how, much, how familiar you are with that. Alice is the maintenance system on the F-35 that it's predictive maintenance. I think the Kessel Run guys are doing a lot of rework on that for Lockheed and others. And uh, maybe they're doing it together with Lockheed. I don't want to misspeak politically, but they're definitely involved in that. And that that's a huge thing because that's what's driving a lot of F-35 costs going in the wrong direction. So if I get on that project, can I get a ride on the F-35? Oh, man, I think there's a lot of actual pilots that would like rides on the F-35. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day. So what other great things are you guys doing over at AFWorks? So right now we're in the midst of a kind of a, a reimagination of all the power that AFWorks can bring to, to airmen. We just got new leadership in the A8. So uh, our three-star is now General Nehu. And he's got his own outlook on, on what AFWorks should be focused on. So we're really starting to double down on our spark cells and that engagement. In terms of our own contracting authority, General Holt partnered with Staff AQ to create a new acquisition office out of AQC that's empowered us to, to do some internal acquisitions where in the past we'd have to go partner 
with organizations to go do an acquisition because we didn't have our own acquisition authority. So while I'm in charge of agile contracting, I couldn't actually sign a contract. Now we have someone in, in the office that can go and sign contracts for us. It's a double-edged sword. Before we had the ability to go partner with people, we had, we had the need to go partner with people to get an acquisition done. And if we had to go partner with somebody, we had to pull them along through the agile contracting knothole, right? Of, hey, we're going to do this different. We're going to think a little differently this time. There's no easy button, if you will. Yeah, I can see that one dragging them through. Oh, They're man. like, but I have a template. <laughs> well, exactly. Well, the funny thing is, the guy on the front lines, they want to do something great. It's all the levels of, bureaucracy and oversight that sits on top of them, they're like, whoa, 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 we have a proven pathway here. It takes 18 months, but it's a proven pathway. And <laughs> it's a culture change process. We're, we're in the middle of it. So now we're, we're, we're doing a lot of that now, really trying to refine AFWorks processes so that we can be more enduring. Right now, we're staffed with a bunch of very unique antibodies within the Air Force, people that maybe weren't super conforming to your traditional rank and file hierarchical structure. And they all found this nice place of AFWorks. That's not always going to be the type of people that get staffed there. So we have to put some processes in place to help magnify the goodness that we bring to the table, but also kind of bound it. And I think that's what the new leadership's really uh, focusing on now. I was surprised though, working over at another agency that shall go unnamed, they wanted to do it. There was a lot of really smart people in contracting. They're like, yeah, we could do that. But there's a lot of just kind of the old guard that's like, remember how we did that like 18 years ago and then 18 months ago, we do this. So that's kind of, there's still, there's people that are smart enough to do it. They're innovative enough to do it. But I think at some point you have to show that it's got value too. So how do you measure? I love the cells. Those things are great. They're like sleeper cells for innovation, right? <laughs> like enable your cells and they activate your cells at some point where they have to go up. But how do you measure that you're doing this better? So, I mean, the traditional way to measure it is over the time horizon, right? How fast are acquisitions, you know, from inception to execution occurring? But really, I think the pinnacle of this new way of thinking success will, will be achieved is when we stop looking at acquisition from hey, the government has money and we're going to trade that for schedule or performance. That's the old paradigm. Time and on budget. Yeah. We want to start looking at what does the Air Force have to offer and what does the industry have to offer and how can we trade to make that a mutual benefit. And in many cases, that's not money. So let me give you an example. The government controls licensing. The government controls access to foreign military sales markets. The government controls access to ranges, certain web classes of weapons, government, you can legally hack other countries, right? So we control access to certain, certain tools and abilities. Giving that access to those different things to industry should make industry more competitive right in the commercial world, right? Should make them have access to more markets. So how do we make those trades to get these new innovative programs started on the front end by just making a nice trade of, hey, you can have access to all this great technology that I have or information that I have or database that I have, and you're going to give me access to the airplane. And we did this uh, with a light attack program. We actually traded. The contractor gave us an airplane. We didn't give them any money. We flew the airplane for three months, evaluated it, tested it out, saw we liked it. In turn, they got to get qualified with certain weapons on that airplane. And we're in the process of opening up a foreign military sales market for low light attack aircraft. Now, these aircraft are extremely inexpensive compared to the traditional aircraft that we fly. They're meant for a permissive environment, but that's the kind of aircraft that most of the world can afford. Yeah. So they have a much bigger foreign military sales market. So it was a great deal and a great trade. So industry invested millions of dollars, right? Being able to do that for the Air Force, the Air Force didn't have to spend millions of dollars to get a good assessment to say, hey, it's a permissive aircraft, something that we would want in our fleet. Yeah. How would you measure get that performance against I did it for eight years. I did it to the accident. I absolutely knew where the money was going. I didn't have the risk of doing it. How do you, how do you convince somebody that was good? Yeah. So we're so metrics driven right now that I think it, that's, it's a hard, hard answer from a metric standpoint. But if you can see the turnover technology, the moment we decide that the next fighter jet is not a 30 year platform, yeah. it's a five year platform, right. maybe like that's, I think the metric that you're looking for is like, we're going to turn technology over. Like I turned my iPhone over. My iPhone is a new iPhone every year. So that is because I was just looking at that. I was like, the fighter jet of today 
is already obsolete. They're almost putting out there to like... It's completely obsolete. So imagine this. What if we were able to take a fighter jet and then standardize the connection points, just like the iPhone, Apple standardized the connections of how the screen connects to the rest of the phone. Every year, we can update the hardware piece, right? What happens inside the box, but the connections are all the same. So that should drive down integration risk. If we can find a standard for that, then we can also create a standard for how information travels over networks. Now we can update in our hardware seamlessly. We can share. It doesn't matter if you have a, uh, you know, uh, an older airplane or a new airplane. Information will cross over that critical abstraction layer seamlessly, just like when I go on my phone and I'm on Wi-Fi or 5G or whatever. It's indifferent to me. It all just works. We can get there if we put together some standards and we work with the industry to, to drive those standards. And that's there's there's some pockets of the Air Force that are thinking about that now. So how does the Hill look at this? So they're like our best friend and our worst enemy. So they've given us tons of tools within the NDAs. Like there's a lot of cool stuff we can do from an acquisition standpoint. But then on the flip side, they're so worried about uh, President Trump building a wall that they put extra restrictions on the money. Or I don't want to change because, you know, a lot of my vote comes from that place that I used to do things the same way before. Yeah, yeah, a lot of yeah. people employed through that. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a whole other thing. I mean... The fact that it took, I don't know, almost uh, 11 months, 10 or 11 months to get Tyndall funded, right? Funded. Funded. This is a natural disaster, hurricane, wipes out a base. And because they were worried about President Trump using the money to go build a wall, they just didn't fund it. That's one reason that they said that it wasn't funded or it failed multiple times, the supplemental funding bill. We need to move past the color of money problem. The DOD and Homeland Security are the only organizations to my knowledge and the government that actually have these, this constraint of the color of money. No one else does. Just give us the money. China doesn't have a color of money constraint. So why are you tying our hands with color of money? Because you want to control the levers of how we spend the money, I suppose, is why they're doing it. But China doesn't have this problem. And we're, that's what we're competing against. We need to, to change the rules to allow us to compete better. We need a competitor is what we need. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think we got one. Is that what you're saying? We got one. China's coming. It's coming. Well, I'll tell you, it's been great talking with you. I'm going to wrap it up, but you have, uh, is there anything else you got for us? Like secret weapons that you can share with us or anything? Secret weapons. I think what we'll find and what Afrix has maybe proven is that our secret weapon are our people. Software. Yeah. Look, talking to Adam, it's like, we're going to be a software company that just happens to wage war. Yeah. Any company that's going to be relevant is going to have that exact same tagline and the Air Force is no different, but it's going to be our people that drive the software change. It's going to be our people that push for it. I mean, so another thing about the Air Force culture that we talked about earlier is I'm 100% telework. Now imagine that. I don't work on a base, but you know, the justification is our internet's too slow. It just doesn't work well enough on the base. Our firewalls are too thick. So it's... Are you telling me that your access, your bandwidth is better at home than it is on a base? Significantly better. Significantly better. And I, I can do everything I need to do for my mobile device. And that's what we're talking. Just talking with Adam is like one of the things they did at Castle Run was move it outside the wall. Move their development to the point where you're just like, you know what? It's not about what we, we produce something and it'll definitely be secured. But don't, don't bog us down with silly stuff. Yeah. So Kessel Run, just like uh, AFWorks, we, we work off of G Suite predominantly for a lot of our, our software tools. The rest of the Air Force doesn't do that. They would go crazy. Um, <laughs> and, and it's crazy because it, it just works. Now, Google gets attacked by China too. Somehow, you know, they get hacked maybe less. I'm not sure. I know I got all my personal information still. I got a letter from the government saying, hey, all your personal files were compromised. Somebody hacked them. It was China. But, but yeah. So, Everyone's susceptible. People are going to get hacked. This is the world we live in. But if the big companies are able to protect the shareholders' interest and protect all their data, barring lawsuits and everything else, we should be able to trust those processes, I think, equally, if not more so, than we trust the current government We're processes. We're going to have to stop going to a zero failure opposition. Yeah, you know, we live in a world where all of everyone's data is out there. So, yes, protect it best you can. Mistakes are going to happen. We'll have to pick up the pieces afterwards, but this is not a nuclear bomb mistake if it occurs. Right? I understand why you want to have a zero failure on the nuclear mission. Oh, yeah. But when it comes to, to some of the data assurance and the ATOs, uh, the authority operate stuff that uh, the CIO controls, like, man, we're just, we need to go faster. Well, it's been good. I thought it'd be good. It was good. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Anytime you want to come back, Definitely. feel free to do so. Definitely. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, brother. 
The Agile Advocate is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentcio.com slash podcasts. The Agile Advocate is produced by Amy Kluber. It is hosted by Bill Drew. Edited by Resonate Recordings. Theme music provided by Big Hoax. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com.